One was talking about different implementation to academic uh, presentation. We saw a nice demo, amazing demo on hacking electronic purse. What we are missing? Bitcoin price manipulation. Is it possible? Can we really change the Bitcoin price? Is it something that we have control on it? How many people is required to put together to manipulate the price of Bitcoin? For that, we have a special professor here at the Tel Aviv University. His research is in this area. I would like to call stage Professor Neil Gendel, which will introduce you how to do manipulation, not how, this is different, how manipulation on Bitcoin can happen. So, Professor, okay. welcome to stage. Thanks. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, and, and also thanks uh, for staying to the end. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. Because sometimes they say I have a very quiet voice. Okay, so this is joint work with colleagues at uh, the University of Tulsa, and we've been working together on a multi-year research project. We have a large grant from the National Science Foundation and the Binational Science Foundation now. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about price manipulation in the Bitcoin ecosystem. What I'm going to talk about right now is something that happened in 2013 and 2014. But uh, I just want to call your attention to the fact that an article recently came out. Recently means last week. It isn't a published article yet. This is a published article, but that, that article talks about possible manipulation of Bitcoin in the 2017 rise and fall. So you might want to take a look at that. Uh, it's from two researchers at the University of Texas. So just to get into it really quickly, in case uh, we don't get to the end. Now, I'm, I know I'm looking at a period of time in which Bitcoin wasn't priced that highly, okay? Uh, but there are a couple interesting things that happened in 2013 and 2014, especially where it goes on during that blue period. And we've managed to identify some suspicious trading that took place during that period. And the reason we're able to identify it is because when Mt. Gox, which was the largest exchange back then, collapsed, all the data went to the internet. Now, of course, all the trading data always exists in the internet. What was the difference between the data that we mostly have and the data that we were able to attain here? We knew the identity, not of the person, but we could, we could associate trades with accounts. So we know that account XYZ made all these trades. And so we were able to recover lots of data, 18 million trades, and we were able to do something very interesting with it. And I'll tell you about it. Just in case I don't get to the end, because you never know when you get to the end here. Here's the bottom line. There were a couple bots that were being run, and what's very interesting is, while we were writing the final version of this paper for the journal, the journal of monetary economics, they asked us to speculate who might be doing this. Well, we speculated that the, the second bot, the one uh, in blue, where the prices are purple, went up a lot, uh, might be run by Mt. Gox itself. And interestingly enough, right as we were rewriting the article, and I'm just putting this over my head because I, I can't see any of you, but uh, right when we were writing the article, um, the owner of Mt. Gox, who was on trial in Japan, admitted to running the bot. He didn't admit to you know, any wrongdoing, but he admitted that they were running the bot. So that was actually very nice for us. But here's the bottom line, and this is really interesting, and you don't need a significant economic analysis to do this or even understand it, I mean, even though we did lots of robustness checks. The bottom line is during the period that this Willy bot was active, what happened? The price of Bitcoin on days the bot was active went up on average by about 5% a day. It's a pretty good return, right? 5% per day, okay? I guess a lot of you might be used to returns that go on in this industry, but in general, that's a great return. On the days when this bot was not active, nothing, no change, okay? And actually, this bot was run in a way that's very friendly to researchers. Why? Because in the 90 days, that, um, which is about a quarter uh, of a year, the bot was only active about half the time. And it was kind of active randomly. So perfect. It's a perfect natural experiment if you're going to do this kind of uh, suspicious trading. And, it was, and uh, it was great for us. And so what happened was, the story is, and this is what uh, Jakob asked, I mean, how could a single actor manipulate this? Because 
This is essentially what we think went on. We're always very careful to say likely because you don't know. Who knows, it may have been something else, but probably, probably, probably not. Okay, it turns out that Mt. Gox, which was the biggest uh, exchange at that time, controlled a ton of the market. So on days when Mt. Gox reported trades, and actually in the case of the yellow bot, they were not actually real trades. We're able to document that they were duplicate trades that didn't exist. But it didn't matter because the message that was sent to the other exchanges was, and to other traders on Mt. Gox, people are buying Bitcoin. So on those days, and here's what happened, the amount traded, the amount bought, went up by a lot. A huge increase in demand, which led to the associated increase in price. The second bot operated actually by real trades in the sense that Mt. Gox was buying bitcoins from its customers uh, and then giving them fiat money like dollars and euros, but people couldn't take the money out of their accounts. Okay. So again, it was, it was a manipulative, uh, distortive type of trade that sent singles again and on those days trading volume went up like crazy and price went up as well. So that's basically the story if we, if we don't get to the end of time. Okay, and I'm not going to spend too much time on every slide because we really don't have too much time. Um, I'm just going to tell you that Mt. Gox was the big one. And look at this. I mean, the red gives you the percentage that Mt. Gox controlled of all the internet, um, of all the uh, Bitcoin trading. Of course, it's not like that right now. Actually, the exchanges are a crazy market themselves. Maybe someday I'll tell you more about that. But you can see that during the period when the the traders, the suspicious trading was taking place, Mt. Gox had a lot of the share of, uh, of the trade. And that's why it was possible, because Mt. Gox was actually the center, the center of things. And I'm not going to get into details here. I have great computer scientists, colleagues at the University of Tulsa. They were able to take these 18 million observations and uh, assign them to the accounts, and we were able to assign them to the days and then see what happened by looking at the price on every single day and the volume on every single day. Like I said, what is uh, important is that we were able to assign the trades to, to people. And um, we weren't the first ones to notice this. There were other people who wrote about the strange behavior. I don't have time to tell you why these accounts seem suspicious. We weren't the first to notice it, but we, what we did was we take it a little further as researchers do, and we did an analysis to see whether there really was cause and effect. And you never know for sure, I mean, but we're fairly confident, this is why we say likely that this is, that this is what went on. Okay, um, and for those of you who are interested, I can send you slides about how it was able to identify, how we were able to identify duplicate trades when the first bot, which is called Marcus, was active, the yellow bot, okay, and um, how we were able to do that. And then the Willy bot was a little more complicated because it had 49 different accounts, but what happened was an account would open it would buy $2.5 million exactly worth of Bitcoin, then it would close, and then another account would open. How did we know these accounts were suspicious? Uh, these accounts were suspicious because they were above the numbering system that Mt. Gox normally used. Okay, and like I said, this wasn't duplicate transactions in the second time when Bitcoin actually went up from 150 to 1,000 and then back down. But in fact, these were transactions with Mt. Gox interacting with its own customers, but Still, um, not the customers were not able to take this out. Why did it happen? We speculate why. Um, Mt. Gox actually lost a lot of Bitcoins. Um, it's been claimed in 2011 when Bitcoins weren't worth very much, right? They were worth about $10 or something. Well, once they were worth $100, then that's a big deficit, and maybe by doing this, Mt. Gox could stay around for a while, but of course, these schemes always collapse, and Mt. Gox itself uh, did collapse. And, which was nice for us, there was an admission at the trial that indeed, Mt. Gox was running the bots. Okay, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the, on the regression things. I'll just show you that the trade this trade that uh, was sometimes not even real trade, but duplicate transactions, was a lot of the trade. Um, in the case of Marcus, 21% of the Mt. Gox trade, 12% of all of the trade, it was enough to move the, the Bitcoin price around, but not in itself, because what it did was it led to a lot more trade, trading, not just on Mt. Gox, but on all the other exchanges as well. Okay, and uh, these are more summary statistics, and of course, you guys are thinking about now what, uh, what happened as we move forward into, into 2017. Um, first, let, before we do that, let me talk about 
what the impact of this was. Once Mt. Gox collapsed, the price went down, back down to $200 from 1,000, and then kind of stayed very low for several years. Didn't, I mean, indeed, it uh, stayed very low for, for several years. And the other coins, many of the other coins, got wiped out. Okay, they were, for example, Litecoin and other coins that we're following, they went down by 99 point something percent, and it took a long time for them to come back. The question is, could this kind of thing be happening today? And if it is, um, how can we detect it, and, and what, can, what can we do about it? First of all, just to tell you something that um, in the day, back in 2013 and 2014, does anyone know how many coins were active? How many of these coins were active, these cryptocurrencies? Any guesses? No, 10 million coins? No, no, not 10 million coins. That's a lot. There's not even 10 million now. About 80. About 80 coins were active back then. And now it's more than 800 coins. A ton of entry. We're also, in our latest research, we're following all the cryptocurrencies. We're trying to see whether something can explain the differential returns um, in the cryptocurrencies. So there's a lot more markets now. There's 800 coins. They can all be traded with each other. You know how many pairs of market that creates. So that can lead to very, very thin markets. Again, we're not saying that um, manipulation is taking place today, but, may, but maybe it is. And if it is, maybe it's taking place in these, um, in these markets in which there is not a whole lot, of, whole lot of trade going on. Again, this is the summary. It's just really stark. And just for those of you who like economics, and no economics, maybe there's no one in this room who likes economics at all, okay, but you can basically control for everything else to see if anything else could have affected the Bitcoin price, DDoS attacks, lots of other things, um, and we find out that nothing did. The bottom line is what you saw on the previous table. On the day these bots were active, uh, prices went up like crazy. So what's the, what's the message? The message is, wow, and this, by the way, I presented this last year, at Berkeley in 2017, before the price went through the roof. And we, we speculated that, well, maybe, you know, maybe we're gonna see another huge rise in Bitcoin's price, and, uh, and then maybe we'll see another huge fall. By the way, I, I must tell you, I don't trade any cryptocurrencies, I don't buy or sell any, and I told all of our research uh, team that now that we're working on this stuff, nobody buys or sells them, so I don't have any particular interest in it uh, at all. But you can see that even at this point, there was a huge rise in, uh, in what was going on. Like I said, the University of Texas researchers are claiming that they found uh, some sort of price manipulation involving Tether. I don't know. I saw the paper. haven't had time to read it carefully. The point is that, and this comes back to what Yaakov said, it may be possible. I mean, if what they found is true, then it means that it is possible for a small number of actors to manipulate things because we're... There's herding behavior, right? I mean, especially in Israel, everyone follows the herd. We don't know where we're going, but you know, we all follow the herd. There's a lot of herding behavior in this. Social networks matter. We're collecting lots of information about social networks for each coin. And by the way, people run what are called pump and dump schemes. They run them publicly on the internet now. You want to get, take part of it? I don't recommend it, of course, but you can, you can find these, these schemes that say, we're basically going to purchase this coin, try to run it up you know, between 2 and 201 on February 17th on this exchange between these two coins pairs. So what can be done, okay? What can be done about this? And why is it important, okay? You know, okay, so Bitcoin went up and down. It went up from 3,000 to 20 and back down to seven. Who cares? Okay, first of all, it affects the ecosystem. There's a lot of... Uh, interesting novel models you heard about that and maybe you know some of them of people that are really in, and uh, groups that are really trying to develop services that use a cryptocurrency and not because they're interested in speculative increase in the value of the cryptocurrency but in order to encourage people to to be trading on the platform so that hurts them secondly there's no question that uh, who got in in the market at the end of the day I knew it was going to be trouble when you know when I went to like cut my hair and my barber asked me whether you know, I should buy Bitcoin, okay? I knew that was gonna be trouble, okay? Because what happened at the end of the day, people were getting in at 17, 18, and 19,000, and you know, then it went back down to seven. So, so what can be done? I think what can be done is, is we need, I mean, I'm in general in favor of free markets, but I think we need some sort of regulation here. I think it's good that the regulators have moved slowly, but now, I think there's a loss of uh, confidence in the system. 
It's true everything is deregulated. There's, there's really no regulator influence. I mean, the SEC now decided that it's going to declare some things to be securities, other things not to be securities. Beyond that, it's a hodgepodge type of thing. And the regulation has to be international. So we're encouraging regulators to think about this seriously, to think about transparency like there are in other stock markets. Again, you might say, who cares? This is a small market, but you know what? The market value of all these cryptocurrencies went up from 15 billion, which already sounds like a something, but maybe it's not too much in the world economy, to half a trillion dollars. That's a lot of money being circulated. And, uh, and I think we as you know, people who are interested and people who want to perhaps buy and sell these things, and lots of firms are doing this right now, I think it's fair to know whether you know, these trades are coming from legitimate sources in, of demand. And until we can follow the trades like we were able to do in this one suspicious case, we'll never be able to know. So it says I have 25 seconds left. I'm going to finish for now. I'm happy to take questions if anyone wants to. Thanks for listening to the end. I really appreciate it. It's not always easy to be the last speaker, but I guess it's only fair because I just got back from a conference where I was the first speaker. So. You know, from, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Neil Gendel. Thank you, sir. Uh, please, wait one second. I would like, first of all, to thank you, staying until now, until the end, listening to this marvelous talk of Professor Neil Gendel and all the rest. And before, before you are leaving, I would like to invite to the stage Gilly. Please come join me to say thank you very much. Applause to Gilly. Marvelous Cyber Week. She didn't sleep, honestly, before, but this week was something really incredible for her. Please come to stay. Join me for the final words to say thank you to the audience and also give them some news about next year conference. Gilly. Thanks, Jacob. I, 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 sorry for my voice. <laughs> This is, uh, this is the consequences of a, a full week. So thank you all for coming, and I would like to invite you all to come again uh, next June. Um, Cyber Week is happening uh, once a year, and you are all invited. Uh, mark your calendars. I, I'll repeat it for those that uh, didn't manage to write it before. It's on the, uh, we are doing Cyber Week on the uh, 23rd till the 27th. So see you next year and I hope you enjoy the conference. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gilly. Thank you. You're welcome. Your husband is here, so I'm allowed to kiss her. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Marian. Thanks, ICRC. And thanks again for the amazing team of Cyber Week. Ravita, Roni, Diana, Daria, um, Alice, Karen, Rotem, uh, um, Marion, Jennifer, Jen. It's a long list, but all of them really, you are, you are amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Gilly. Thank you, everybody. Safe trip back home. Keep yourself safe. See you next year on blockchain. Thank you, guys.